and uh, I don't know, he's always experimenting, he's always watching, he's always doing things a little differently to, to try to make it even more sustainable, but I think, I think the key is probably hard work, you know, a lot of labor, plus um, the notion of always building up the soil. Do you know if there have been any studies as to where our food actually comes from and you know, so that we can set a benchmark for what do we really need to work on to develop local um, supplies of certain items? Do I know where it comes Has anyone done anything like that? Do you, do you mean like um, countries or? No, just, just you know, like our grocery stores, our, our, mm -hmm. our big box stores. Where do they get those foods? And how um, do we then supplement them with? Where, where do the big box store get their food? Are you talking about more produce or everything? Yeah. Um, and maybe just a matter of just developing our own local supplies. So yeah. And, and the thing is, they get it from all different kinds. It's a hard question to answer because, you know, they always want to have a huge display of tomatoes. And right. so sometimes the year might be from Chile and sometimes from Holland or sometimes from, I don't know, you know, different times of year from different places. Um, a lot from California and Florida at certain times of year. I think, what did I hear? 70% of our produce in Illinois comes from California and Florida. Mainly California, I believe, from the San Joaquin Valley. Um, is you know, where if you go to any grocery store and look at the lettuce and the celery and all that stuff, I would say probably a good 70% is coming from California. Mm -hmm. But more and more is coming from these, you know, more distant places. Uh, and I think it's always changing, too. I mean, if you, if you looked at something one week and looked at it another week, you might find that it, it had come. And they don't even label it, do they? I mean, sometimes they do, but it, it would be a hard thing. It'd be an interesting project, though. Well, I, I do it all the time, and, and yeah. I've noticed that Meyer has a lot more from Michigan. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. They tend, so I do oh, interesting. Things, okay. see, but, but it is interesting that, um, yeah, so I just wondered if there had been any and local stores, I mean, I don't know if you have any um, independently owned stores, but if you do, they are very receptive. Uh, there's a small community downstate called Fairbury, you know, very, very few people in the community, but they have a store called Dave's Supermarket run by a family for generations. And Dave's Supermarket realizes that they need to have something that makes them different from the big box stores and the Walmarts and everything. So they have really embraced local food in that small community. And there's a whole bunch of farmers now bringing food into that store. And they've made it easy for those farmers. Um, it's, it's actually one of the few little success stories I can point to. That's the same community, though, that um, the only community that was going to have a McDonald's start, a McDonald's restaurant in the community, and the community disallowed it. <laughs> I don't know how they managed. <laughs> What's that? A picture of Henry. I have a picture of Henry. I think it was the one where we look like, oops. Oops, what did I do? Um, in the center of the center picture. Um, oh. <laughs> so uh, in the center picture, my dad's on the right, and then me, and then Matt, the tall guy, is, is our farmhand for eight years now. He's an artist and a farmhand. And then Henderson has on me, and then Henry, the bald guy. Henry started going bald when he was about 20. <laughs> I should laugh. Um, <laughs> and that's his daughter, Zoe, and then one of our interns, Courtney, who, um, who was a, a chef. She had actually graduated from culinary school and she had worked in various um, restaurants and catering and then she decided she wanted to really know where food came from and she came to work with us for a whole year. So. I had a question. Uh, I wondered if you were aware of the Illinois Local Food Task Force study that was put out last year that encourages farmers to diversify. I wondered what you thought about that. The, uh, they're encouraging by uh, 10 to 20% of the food. Yeah. Um, she's talking about the Illinois Food Farms and Jobs Act. It was passed last um, August, I believe. And um, I think it was a good thing. It really um, educated a lot of people and sort of galvanized some people throughout the state about growing more local food, you know, fruits, vegetables, meats, eggs, like whole food for pe healthy um, food for people's tables. And um, I wasn't on, on the task force, but I knew a lot of people who were. And now that task force has morphed more or less into a standing committee of some sort. 
And, and if you read that document, it's actually a good document, the thing they came out with, which is a pretty good roadmap to how we can get to 10% or 20% of the food in, in our various communities in Illinois to be locally grown and keep money within our community. The only problem I see with it is that it has no teeth at all. And given the state of our state, um, a budget wise, um, you know, so it has these goals, which are wonderful goals, but is anybody going to pay any attention? Is anything going to get done? To me, that's a big question. So what I do and what I would advise you to do, I started to work with my local community down there. Our, we have a mayor in the town of Normal who is very keen on this stuff, and he um, formed a, a local foods task force in that community. So we're just dealing in a small, you know, it's much easier to do something on your small local level. And you know the players, you know your farmers, you know your stores, you know your institutions and schools. And, and in, in, in Central Illinois, Illinois Wesleyan wants local food, Illinois State wants local food, State Farm wants local food. I mean, there's way more people wanting local food than we have production, but we're starting to get all these people together. And I have a farmer down the road who already grows organic grain, and he said, I would put in five acres of potatoes, but I'm not going to put it in unless I know somebody's going to buy just tons and tons of potatoes. And so, you know, it's kind of chicken and egg thing, but I would say, you know, don't wait for the food farms and jobs um, task force people. I'm glad they're there and I'm glad they're working on it. I don't have a lot of faith just because there's no funding and there's no, like, there's no teeth in it. It's just this, this lofty goal, kind of, and you can sort of do it or you can ignore it, and most people are probably going to ignore it. So I would say work on your local level to try to make that, that Food Farm and Job Act real in your own community. I think we have three more questions that I see. So. Um, I was wondering about corn. It seems like it's in everything now and being used for everything. And I, I was wondering if you knew when did that sort of start and what's it doing to us? Um, have you read Michael Pollan's The Omnivore's Dilemma? That, that will tell you pretty much everything you want to know about corn. I'm trying to remember now. Um, was it in the early 80s, he said, that it became like in, in everything? So I, I luckily just missed that. And it, it's like kids who grew up, you know, um, with a generation younger than me, um, pretty much had it in their diet from day one, pretty much. Whereas I didn't at that time. There was still cane sugar more than corn syrup and things like that. Um, so, so it happened for very clear reasons looking back, which was um, government policy, you know. I mean, that's what was rewarded, that's what was made easy, that was what was made safe to do, was to grow corn and grow more corn. And, and then that made it very easy for large corporations to, use, to have a cheap um, raw material for their processed food, and that's why our processed food is so cheap. Um, what was, it? was another part of your question? It's kind of Oh, what's it doing? You know, corn in itself is not a bad thing. I mean, um, you know, we have sort of demonized, Michael Pollan has demonized corn and corn syrup. Um, I would say that genetically modified is questionable, you know, but and which is in, of course, all processed food these days. Um, what's it doing to us? I, I don't know. Um, I, I feel like corn is actually this, this wonderful thing that was developed by native, you know, Mesoamericans over thousands and thousands of years as a very high energy, high carbohydrate and nutritious thing. It's just that we've morphed it into a, uh, you know, first through hybrid, just regular hybrid breeding, and now through GMO breeding, into something that <laughs> is is not maybe as nutritious or as um, good for us as, as it could and should be in its original form. But I, I don't know if it's like, it makes cows sick because cows aren't supposed to have corn. They're supposed to have their ruminants. They're supposed to have grass and cellulose. They're not supposed to digest corn. But I, I don't know if it's it's. It's just that we eat too much of it. I think in itself, it's not a bad thing. Um, and I would say if you, if you can, though, try to buy organic stuff, because that would be non-GMO. I have a question for you. Um, I'd just like to hear your perspective or give some insight about um, mass-produced organic mm -hmm. products. Because you, know, you can go to your, your jewel box, go to down and there's that section. So are, if you're buying that product, are you still helping out in those terms, or is that, you know, that kind of a facade is that really not, you know, what they're what they're making it out? Yeah. Um, the question about mass-produced organic food. I, I at first I was real happy when we had organic standards and real happy to buy any organic food, figuring that every single acre that had organic food on it, I didn't even care if it was in China, is you know an acre that doesn't have synthetic herbicides and pesticides and 
fertilizers and stuff. But I, I've begun to change my mind a little bit on that, and I think that um, when we codified, you know, when we had the regulations that said this is organic, then we have all these crafty, you know, 